Welcome to the video for chapter 23. Today we're going to really have a change of focus from uh, transmission of propagation of electromagnetic waves through free space and dielectrics. Today we're going to focus on transmission lines. And that's quite different from what we've been talking about in the past, but it's also extremely important. Don't worry, we'll get back to free space in a little bit when we talk about uh, uh, antennas and, and generation of electromagnetic waves. But for the next few lessons, we're going to talk about transmission lines, which are really extremely important. This might be the material in the entire course that you will find the most applicable to your career. So we're going to talk a lot about transmission lines, what makes something a transmission line, and how do we have to treat transmission lines specially. Uh, today's uh, historical perspective is Samuel Morse. You've almost certainly heard his name from Morse code, but he was also one of the, well, he was the first person to develop a single wire telegraph, although there were several people who did it all at the same time or near the same time, and several people brought it out to market before he did, but he was the first. Uh, and most importantly, he helped create the relays that could boost the signal. Um, because when, when uh, telegraph was first invented, it could really only travel a few hundred feet before it would dissipate to nothingness uh, and he uh, solved that problem and figured out a way to boost the signal uh, and then of course he also developed Morse code uh, and did a good job of figuring out uh, which letters are the most common how can we transmit those common letters uh, as quickly as possible and make the less common letters uh, less uh, sort of harder to, to transmit so let's talk a little bit about what is a transmission line. A transmission line is, is put as simply as possible. It's just a long wire. It's just a long cable. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a something that's going to transmit a signal over a long distance. And you might ask yourself, well, what defines it to be a long distance? And the answer is the wavelengths that are being transmitted. So for example, you could find that there might be a, a if you're transmitting a low frequency wave, it might need to be miles or even thousands of miles to be a, a transmission line. If you're transmitting a very high frequency wave, it could just be millimeters that would be a, a transmission line. So whether your interest lies in uh, power systems or whether your interest lies in chip design, uh, communication systems, uh, whatever it is, uh, transmission lines will hit all aspects of electrical and computer engineering. Now, it, there isn't a hard and fast rule, but the rule that we're going to use in this class is that if the length of the wire, which I'm representing by delta Z, is greater than or equal to one-tenth of the, of the longest, I'm sorry, of the shortest wavelength. So when we're talking about the shortest wavelength, that means it'll be the highest frequency. So think about what is the highest frequency of wave you're going to be transmitting, convert that into a wavelength, and then figure out whether or not the, the length of the wire is greater than or equal to 10% of that length. Well, right away, let's do some examples here. Determine whether each of these scenarios would qualify as a transmission line. So we have a 60 hertz signal, sounds like electricity uh, over, over uh, power transmission lines, uh, being transmitted over a wire that is 10 kilometers long. So does that count? Well, let's just take a minute here, and I'm, I'm sort of going to go up here in the space above, and I'm just going to remind you that we have an equation, lambda equals 2 pi divided by k. And then we also have an equation k equals omega divided by c, which is equal to 2 pi f divided by c. And so if I combine those two equations together, I get lambda equals 2 pi divided by k, but k is 2 pi f over c. So that puts a 2 pi f in the denominator and a c in the numerator. The 2 pi's cancel, and we're left with c divided by f. Now c here, of course, would become the velocity of propagation if it's not free space. We're assuming that this is free space, or, or at least, let me say it this way, it's a transmission line, so it's not free space. We're just assuming that the propagation velocity is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. We'll come back and talk a lot more about that later, but, but this is actually very common to find that, uh, that the propagation velocity on a transmission line is very frequently going to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, or maybe just a little bit less than that. So we have an easy and quick way to calculate the wavelength. Lambda is C divided by F, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by 60. That's going to be a pretty big number. It's 5 times 10 to the 6th meters, 5 million meters, or 5,000 kilometers. 5,000 kilometers. And so 10% of that would be 500 kilometers. Anything more than 500 kilometers, we would need to account for it as a transmission line. This wire is only 10 kilometers long, so therefore delta Z is less than lambda divided by 10, and so therefore no, this is not a transmission line. We have a 100 kilohertz signal being transmitted over a wire that is 10 kilometers long. 
Well, lambda equals c divided by f, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th, divided by the frequency in this case is 100 times 10 to the third, 100 kilohertz. That turns out to be 3 times 10 to the fourth meters, uh, which is, uh, that's going to be 30 kilometers. And so therefore, um, we see that uh, delta z is in fact greater than or equal to lambda divided by 10. Lambda over 10 would be three kilometers. This wire is 10 kilometers long. And so therefore, yes, we do have to count this as, as a transmission line. Let's just take a minute and think about what is that lambda over 10? Where did that come from? Well, if you have a, a transmission line, let me just say I've got a transmission line here. I know that this is a little bit of an aside to this problem, but if, if the voltage along that entire transmission line is pretty much constant, in other words, if the signal is propagating so quickly that, that basically every point has the same voltage, you know, if the voltage is like this, then we pretty much don't need to worry about any sort of propagation issues or any sort of, of, of delay issues. <clears throat> but on the other hand, if, if the signal is going up and down and up and down along the length of this wire, then yeah, we do need to consider whether or not uh, it, is, it is propagating properly. But if I take the middle here, let me, let me I'll just draw another transmission line. Uh, if it's lambda over 10, then maybe you'd say, I'm gonna get one tenth of a wavelength. So maybe, maybe it's sort of going up like this and, and it's not quite hitting the plateau yet, but it's still changing. You know, we're seeing one tenth or 10% of the full wavelength there, 10% <clears throat> of the full cycle. There is some variability. And so we probably should count this as a transmission line. That's the case for part B. Uh, but it was not the case for part A. In part A, that was where we saw that it was pretty much just one constant voltage along the full length of the wire. Okay, let's do a one megahertz signal over a wire that is 100 meters long. Lambda is equal to C divided by F, which is three times 10 to the eighth divided by 10 to the sixth. And that works out to be uh, 300 meters. And if the wire is 100 meters long, lambda over 10 is 30 meters long, then yes, delta Z is greater than or equal to lambda over 10. And so therefore, yes, we must treat this one as a transmission line. And then finally, uh, now we have a wire that's only one millimeter long, but it's at 10 gigahertz. You know, you might have a very high speed digital system that's running at 10 gigahertz. Do you have to consider uh, a wavelength, uh, I'm sorry, a, a wire that's one millimeter long? Is that gonna count as a, as a transmission line? Let's see. Lambda equals C over F, which is three times 10 to the eighth, divided by 10 times 10 to the ninth, because it's gigahertz. That works out to be 0 0.03 meters, which is three centimeters. One tenth of that would be 0.3 centimeters or three millimeters. We're close. But no, delta Z is less than, well, I don't want to say less than or equal, it is strictly less than lambda over 10. And so therefore, no, this is not a transmission line, but it's close. Uh, uh, and, and if this were a two millimeter line, or uh, okay, technically, if it were a three millimeter line, then yes, it would be right at the borderline of being a transmission line. So when you hear transmission line, I don't want you to think big, long wire. I want you to think big long wire relative to the wavelength of the signal that's being transmitted. Now, we understand how we can determine whether or not something is a transmission line, but what do we do if it is a transmission line? So what we're going to do is we're gonna think about the, uh, the parasitic or stray capacitance and inductance. And we have actually calculated stray capacitance and inductance before for a coaxial cable. Um, and we just didn't talk about it very much at the time, but boy, those calculations turned out to be quite important. So we go back to uh, example 9.4, where we found the stray capacitance and the stray inductance was in example 15.3. I don't want you to think that I've pulled the next two equations out of the air. Uh, the, they were written in examples, so they didn't get their own equation numbers back then. So I'm giving them equation numbers now, but these are the results of those two example problems. So we can calculate the capacitance of, of uh, a coaxial cable. We can calculate the inductance of a coaxial cable. Remember, any physical, uh, any physical piece of conductor or any, any sort of physical object that, that has uh, charge and current associated with it will have a capacitance and an inductance. Coaxial cable is no exception to that. 
And here, A, and we'll have a picture of this later on, but A is the radius of the inner conductor, B is the radius of the outer conductor, and delta Z is the length of the wire. So if it is this stray capacitance and this stray inductance, in fact, that prevents the signal from propagating infinite, infinitely fast. Now we know that it's not possible for anything to propagate infinitely fast. The speed of light is the speed limit of the universe. And so therefore we can see that the stray capacitance and the stray inductance, neither one of them can go to zero. Uh, no matter how hard we work, no matter how hard we try, stray capacitance and stray inductance will always exist in any physical structure that we create. Now, that straight capacitance and inductance aren't like, here's a chunk of inductance at the end of the wire and here's a chunk of capacitance at the other end of the wire. They're distributed along the length of the wire. And so the best way for us to model this would be to distribute that capacitance along the length of the model. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate C hat and L hat. This hat here turns out to be very important because the hat is gonna be our, our distinction of the fact that this is per unit length. You're probably gonna get tired of me saying that phrase per unit length. But if we're talking about a one millimeter wire versus a one kilometer wire, we need to know how much capacitance are we talking about in those two cases. Here's a model that we can use to represent a lossless transmission line. And I just wanna, for the moment, I wanna highlight this phrase lossless. Every transmission line also has stray resistance. It also has uh, resistance that we can't uh, overcome unless maybe it happens to be made of superconductors, but most transmission lines are not gonna be made of superconductors. But even if they're very good conductors, they're still gonna have some tiny amount of resistance. We're gonna come back and talk about that in three or four chapters. But for right now, we're gonna have a model that doesn't account for that resistance. Remember, that resistance turns out to be pretty important. When I talked about Samuel Morse, I said that one of his greatest accomplishments was figuring out how to make the signal go more than a few hundred feet. And it was that resistance that was preventing that. So just be aware that this model, as we're presenting it here in this figure, doesn't include any sort of resistance. We're going to have to come back and include resistance later. But for now, it's our first time talking about transmission lines. Let's cut ourselves some slack. We can see that this is what a model of a transmission line would look like. Uh, there, are, there, there are little pieces of induct inductance along the whole length of the wire, little pieces of capacitance along the, the whole length of the wire. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I just wanna make a note about here is that when this, this, this L hat is not necessarily referencing per meter. Um, it might be that this is this might be per centimeter or per quarter meter. It's per unit length, but we still need to figure out what the what that unit length is going to look like, and the and the unit length here is going to be the delta z. So we're going to have little blocks of 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 this circuit, and so here you can see, for example, here is one block of the circuit, and you might want to have four blocks, or you might want to have ten blocks. You might want to have a, an infinite number of blocks. You know, ultimately your goal would be to have the best possible model, and the best possible model is going to be the limit as delta z goes to zero. So you would not have one inductor per centimeter and one inductor and one capacitor per centimeter. You would have an infinite number of, of tiny, infinitely small capacitors and infinitely small inductors all jammed right next to each other. And we're not going to be able to build that, obviously. We won't even be able to draw it, but we will be able to, uh, to analyze it mathematically. So let's uh, draw a distributed model for a one meter piece of coaxial cable with an inner radius of two, uh, uh, of two centimeters and an outer radius of seven centimeters. The relative dielectric constant is five. We're going to use four capacitors and four inductors, just like was shown in the previous model. So we can see then that if we have a one meter uh, piece of coaxial cable and we're going to have four of these things, well then delta Z is going to be equal to uh, one, one meter divided by four, which is going to be 0.25. And so we'll, we'll come back and, and, and talk about that here in just a little bit, but for right now I just want you to be aware of the fact that we're going to be working with uh, a quarter meter uh, blocks of this. So C hat I'm gonna go back to the equation. I'm gonna scroll up here. I'm just gonna make a note that um, we have C hat is, hold on a second, C hat is equal to C divided by delta Z. So we have this equation for C hat. And we have this equation for C of a, of a coaxial cable. Well, if I divide that by delta Z, the delta Z just goes away. And so this quantity right here is actually C hat. And this quantity right here is actually L hat. We'll see that more specifically later on in, in the lesson, but for right now, just be aware that the, for C hat and L hat, the delta Zs are gonna go away. <clears throat> so let's see, in this case, C hat is 
2 pi epsilon 0 epsilon r divided by the natural log of b over a. And that works out to be 2 pi times 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12th, uh, and that's times 5 because the relative dielectric constant of the material between the conductors is 5. That's divided by the natural log of 7 centimeters, which is 0 0.07, divided by 2 centimeters, which is 0 0.02. Plug all that into your calculator, you get 2.22 times 10 to the minus 10th farads per meter, or in engineering notation, 222 picofarads per meter. So that's C hat. And then L hat is going to be mu sub 0, mu sub r, over 2 pi times the natural log of b divided by a, which is 1.2566 times 10 to the minus sixth times 1 divided by 2 pi times the natural log of 0 0.07 divided by 0 0.02. That works out to be 2.51 times 10 to the minus seventh henrys per meter, or 251 nano henrys per meter. And so now what we can do is we can take each one of those uh, uh, per unit length and notice that that's per meter, but what we really want is per quarter meter. Because ultimately, remember that our, our circuit diagram is going to look like this. It's going to be four inductors and four capacitors. And as we're drawing this, remember that this entire thing represents one meter, and we were specifically told to do four sections of it. And so we can take each of these numbers, the 222 and the 251, and multiply them by a quarter meter. So I'm going to say, well, C hat times delta Z is going to be 222 picofarads per meter multiplied by a quarter meter. And that's going to give me, um, uh, let's see, that's going to give me 55.5 picofarads. And then L hat times delta Z is going to be 251 nanohenries per meter times a quarter meter. And that's going to give me 62.6, whoops, not milla, nanohenries. And then I can just draw that on here, 62.6 nanohenries, 62.6 nanohenries, whoop, I did it again, nanohenries, 62.6 nanohenries, 62.6 nanohenries, and then the capacitance, 55.5 picofarads, 55.5 picofarads, and I'll do that two more times. Got the wrong decimal place there, 55.5 picofarads. Don't worry, we're not going to do this for very long. And 55.5 picofarads. So this model, this, this model that has four blocks to it, is a very good approximation of, of, of a coaxial cable with an inner radius of 2 centimeters, an outer radius of 7 centimeters, and a relative dielectric constant of 5. If we took a one meter piece of that coaxial cable, it would behave very much like this circuit that we've drawn here. So that's very interesting that we can take a coaxial cable and we can represent it by capacitors and inductors. Now it'd be very hard for us to go in the storage room and find a, an inductor that was 62.6 nanohenries or, or a capacitor that's 55.5 picofarads. But if we could, the behavior between those would be good. Now it wouldn't be perfect. And, and there's two reasons why it's not perfect. One is that there are no resistors shown here, and the other one is that there are only four blocks. What we would really like is an infinite number of blocks, but barring the possibility of an infinite number of blocks, maybe 10 or 20 blocks would be a better approximation. So that's, that's something to think about as, as we're looking at these transmission lines. Now, let's not have to continually draw this equivalent circuit over and over and over again. It's good to know the theory that underlies everything, but we, we, we need some equations, and we need to understand how are the signals going to propagate, and that's where the transmission line equations are going to come in. So we're going to, first off, start, start by doing Kirchhoff's current law uh, at the point labeled V of Z in figure 23.1. So let me go back up here, and I'm going to come up to 
this figure right here, and I'm going to do Kirchhoff's current law at this point right here. Now, of course, there's a current flowing here, I of z, and if we've labeled that being I of z and it's flowing into the node z, then I would suspect that we could label this one as I of z plus delta z, because it's flowing into the node z plus delta z. And then similarly down here, we know that the current that's flowing through that capacitor is going to be C dV dt. So there are three currents, and we can, we can write those three currents into a Kirchhoff's current law, and Kirchhoff's current law is going, to, is going to result in this equation right here. So I of z is flowing in from the left. We have C, so this C delta, C hat delta Z, that's the, that's the capacitance value that is, that is at that, that particular uh, node. Just as we multiplied each of, of the quantities in this example by delta Z, so we're going to multiply them in this example by delta Z. So it's C dV dt, uh, and then the current flowing out to the right. So this one is from the left, this one is uh, down, and this one is to the right. Now, if we take that equation and we move uh, and we rearrange it so that uh, we end up with this expression on the left, then the right hand side becomes negative c hat dv dt, or partial of v with respect to t. And this should look familiar. This quantity should look an awful lot like the definition of a derivative. If we took the limit as delta z goes to zero, that in fact is the definition of a derivative. So as you can see here, if I take the limit as delta z goes to zero, that becomes the partial of i with respect to z. So if that's equal to the, to the limit, and if I take the limit up here, I mean taking the limit as delta z goes to zero of both sides of this equation, delta z goes to zero, that doesn't do anything to the right hand side. So that means that this quantity here is equal to that quantity there. And so we can say the partial of i with respect to z is equal to negative c hat times the partial of v with respect to t. So one side is a derivative with respect to z, the other side is a derivative with respect to t. Up here we have it's a function of i, and this is a function of v. There's a lot of stuff going on in that equation, but it's a good equation, and it takes the limit as delta z goes to zero. So we have an infinite number of blocks in our equivalent circuit, which gives us some assurance that this is going to be an, a, a precisely exact equation. This, in fact, has, is known as the first of the two transmission line equations. It's also known as the one of the two telegrapher's equations. Uh, but we're going to now, we just did Kirchhoff's current law, now we're going to do Kirchhoff's voltage law. Before we show that one, let me come back up here to the circuit diagram and just say, let me erase a few of these things in here. Um, as we're doing the loop here, so as we're doing this loop right here, uh, just remember that this will be V of Z minus delta Z. And we need to know the, the voltage across this inductor. Well, that's going to be L hat delta Z partial of I with respect to T. And then, of course, this is going to be V of Z. So plus to minus, and this is V of Z minus delta Z plus to minus. So if we do this Kirchhoff's voltage log loop, we're going to get the uh, left capacitor, then the inductor, then the right capacitor. There'll be three terms, and we'll be able to write that equation. And in fact, that's this equation right here. So this is the left, uh, the left capacitor. This is the inductor. And then this is the right capacitor. And we can again rearrange that equation to get something that looks a lot like a derivative. Take the limit as delta z goes to zero. We get a, a partial derivative of v with respect to z. That's equal to negative l uh, times the partial derivative of i with respect to t. Um, and we end up with the second of the two telegraphers or transmission line equations. Now, when the subject of the lesson is called transmission lines, and the equation is called, or the two equations are called the transmission line equations, you get the idea that these are very important equations. And in fact, they really are. These two, these two equations, and it's a shame that I can't show them on the page at the same time, but the two that have boxes around them, these two equations give relationships between I and V with respect to Z and T. And so, um, and, and there's an L hat and a C hat tossed in there as well. It's very interesting because I don't know if you, if you remember back to when we derived Maxwell's equations, there was a relationship between the electric field and the magnetic field. 
uh, that was a, a derivative, a, a differential equation. And then there was another differential equation that was the relationship between magnetic field and electric field. So they were complementary of each other. And in the same way, voltage and current are complementary of each other here. Because there's voltage, there's current, and that's with respect to space, and that's with respect to time. So, great. We have uh, taken a transmission line, converted it into an equivalent circuit, and then that equivalent circuit, we've written two differential equations based just on Kirchhoff's laws. We've, we've done everything from the fundamental concepts, taken the limit as delta z goes to zero, so it's not even an approximation. These two equations are 100% accurate. Now, let's take the derivative of both sides of the first telegraphers or transmission line equation with respect to time. So let me come back up here and, and highlight that equation. I'll remove these little stray marks here. And I'm going to take the, the derivative with respect to time. And what that does is it makes these into second derivatives. The left-hand side becomes first derivative with respect to z and first derivative with respect to time. The right-hand side becomes second derivative with respect to time. And that's really what's going to be appearing right down here. So that's, that's equation 23.14. We're going to do the same thing with equation 23.13. So I'm going to take the, the partial with respect to time. Oh, sorry, partial with respect to space. So this is going to become the second derivative with respect to space. And this is going to be partial of t and partial of z. And this is going to be the second derivative there. And so that's where I get equation 23.15. Now it doesn't really matter whether you do the partial of t and then the partial of z, or whether you do the partial of z and then the partial of t. These two are actually equal to each other. And I've moved the, the negative 1 over l hat to the, to the left hand side. If those two are equal to each other, then that must mean that these two are also equal to each other. So we can now write an equation that sets those two equal to each other. And that's the equation 23.16. I'll multiply both sides through by a, a negative l hat, and I'll bring the other derivative over to the left-hand side, and, I'm, and I end up with, oh, that should have been 23.17. Um, equation 23.17, which now all of the other numbers are going to be off by 1. So just know that this equation with the box around it, that is the form of the wave equation. And I don't remember if you, I don't know if you remember whether it was such a big deal when we were able to derive the wave equation from Maxwell's equations, because that said that electromagnetic fields would propagate according to the wave equation that we could calculate their velocity of propagation. We did all of that just basically based on Ampere's circuital law and Faraday's law. Well, here we did this analysis based on the equivalent circuit and then Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law. And we've also ended up with the wave equation. So that means that electrical signals uh, along transmission lines flow as waves in exactly the same way that they did in free space. Um, they're, 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 maybe they're going to uh, transmit with a different velocity, but they will still follow the same exact rules. And, uh, and we could do a similar derivation, uh, and that would give us uh, uh, the same equation in terms of, of current. Notice that this is the equation in terms of voltage. This is the equation in terms of current. But everything else in those equations is identical to each other. That means that the, velo the, the voltage and the current are going are gonna to march in step with each other. As a matter of fact, it is, the, it is changes in voltage that create current and changes in current that create voltage. And so they're sort of building on each other to propagate in exactly the same way that changes in electric field built, uh, changes in, uh, built a magnetic field and changes in magnetic field built an electric field, and they built on top of each other to propagate. It's sort of like I have a ladder and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach a higher point and then you're going to build from that point to reach the next point and then I'll build off of your point. That's what these electric fields and, and magnetic fields, or in this case, the current and the voltage are doing. Current and voltage must both be present in order to propagate. If, if either one of them is absent, then neither one of them will propagate. And then uh, based on that equation, based on the wave equation, we can see that the velocity of propagation, because remember that this term right here is typically going to be uh, minus 1 over c squared. So we can see that, uh, is, uh, well, maybe not c. It will be minus 1 over the velocity squared. So then the velocity will be 1 over the square root of l hat times c hat. So what's the propagation velocity for a wave that's passing along that coaxial cable that we just uh, analyzed? Well, we can see that the velocity is going to be 1 over the square root of l hat times c hat. And we've already calculated l hat and c hat. l hat was 2.22 times 10 to the negative 10th. And c hat was 2.51 
times 10 to the negative seventh. And when we plug all of that into our calculator, we get 1.34 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Now, I've mentioned this in the past, but this is the time to really bring it back up again. If I had made a, ca a calculation mistake in, in either L hat or C hat or this calculation that I just did, it's possible that this number could have come out higher than 3 times 10 to the 8th. But if you get a velocity of propagation that is higher than 3 times 10 to the 8th, you have made a mistake. Either you're wrong or Albert Einstein is wrong. And I love you, but my money is on Einstein. So uh, keep, it at, keep it at 3 times 10 to the 8th or less. If you can't find your mistake and you are out of time, the, the exam is ending or it's three o'clock in the morning and you can't keep your eyes open, write me a note out to the side that says, I know this can't be right because no velocity propagation can ever be higher than three times 10 to the eighth. And then I'll know, at least in my heart, I'll know that you understood that it was wrong. Okay, now the, the, re the rest of today is really just uh, applications of what we've seen. Um, we, we've already just talked about uh, coaxial cables, but I just wanted to give you the full picture of a coaxial cable. The inner radius is A, the outer radius is B, the length of the coaxial cable is gonna be delta Z, and then here are the, f here are the official equations for C hat and L hat. Nothing really new here. Uh, we've already seen all of this, but I just wanted to, to do it this formally because I'm about to do two other types of transmission lines equally formally. Now the second type is, is what's known as a microstrip line. And microstrip lines are used in, in, uh, in integrated circuits or printed circuit boards. Essentially what happens is maybe you're, you're transmitting a signal, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a clock signal, maybe it's power, maybe you're transmitting voltage uh, to, to power the rest of the chip. But typically, uh, you're gonna have a signal that's going one direction from the top layer and the other direction on the bottom layer. And in between is some sort of an insulator that has a relative dielectric constant of epsilon r. So this, this, could be, uh, this could actually be substantially long. You could be looking at something that's, you know, from an integrated circuit perspective, millimeters long would be very, very long. Uh, but again, if the frequency is high enough, that can, that can still be a, a transmission line. So this is the geometry of a microstrip line. Just be aware that, that W is the width of the line and D is the height of the line. It might have been better to have called that H, but we're going to call it D. <coughs> now, we could actually apply Gauss's law and Ampere's circuital law to calculate the, the stray capacitance and the stray, the stray inductance of that structure. I'm not going to make you go through that today. I'm just going to tell you that this is what they are, that we would end up with C hat is epsilon zero, epsilon r, times W divided by D. Remember, by the way, that the combination of these two multiplied together, we just reference it as epsilon. I usually do formally spell it out here, but I just want you to be aware that if you see it somewhere else, that that combination is epsilon in the same way that mu sub zero times mu sub r can just be referenced as mu. So it might be easy to call this epsilon W over D and mu D over W. So that would be another way of representing these quantities if we were to use that shorthand notation. So you would be entirely capable of driving this. I might ask you to do it in class, but for now, uh, just know that these are the equations for, uh, for the stray capacitance and the stray inductance per unit meter of, of a microstrip line. Now the third and final type of, of uh, transmission line that we're gonna look at in this, in this book is, uh, is a twin lead transmission line. And that's just as simple as it can be two wires. You know, one of them has a, a signal going in one direction, one of them has the signal going back in the opposite direction, uh, and we see that there's a distance capital D between the two wires, and that there's the diameter of each of the two wires is equal to A. That's the diameter, not the radius. So sometimes professors like to trick you up. I might, uh, I might toss in a radius and then remember that you'd have to multi multiply that by two to get the diameter. So it's the diameter of each lead, not the radius. A derivation of capacitance and inductance per unit length of this uh, transmission line is very challenging. And we're not gonna take the time to do it, but I'm gonna give you the results. And so here you can see that these are the, these are the capacitance per unit meter and the inductance per unit meter and you have pi, epsilon zero, epsilon r. By the way, the, the, the space in between these two has an epsilon r. Technically, it also has a mu sub r, but essentially mu sub r is always gonna be equal to one. Uh, you would never put a piece of iron in between two pieces of metal that wouldn't insulate them. So it doesn't make sense for that to be anything other than one. So you could almost uh, just always think of that as being equal to one. But you might very well have a dielectric constant epsilon r that was something other than one. 
uh, and the inverse or the uh, yeah the inverse hyperbolic cosine is about as obscure as something can get and still be expected that you saw it in high school. Um, so I just wanted to remind you that if you haven't calculated the inverse hyperbolic cosine of something before, you can calculate it as the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared minus 1. But if you have a TI calculator or an HP calculator, it absolutely does this calculation. They may refer to it as the a cosh, the, uh, the arc hyperbolic cosine. Um, but it's under the math, it's under math, under hyperbolic. So just, just look for it, and that way you won't have to do this calculation on your homework or in an exam. Just do the inverse hyperbolic cosine. And if you're doing it um, not on an exam, there are lots of, uh, lots of hyperbolic uh, trigonometric calculators that you can use on the internet as well. So that shouldn't be an impedance to you at all. No pun intended. Okay, so let's do some example calculations because uh, we're just about to wrap things up here. I just want to do some examples of what do each, each of these transmission lines look like, and then I want to give you one really, I think, I hope it's interesting to you. It's definitely interesting to me, little insight that comes from this. So what is C hat uh, for a microstrip line? It's epsilon zero, epsilon r, w divided by d. And up here, I'm just going to make a note that w is 0 .0, whoops, 0 0.001 meters because it's one millimeter, and uh, D is going to be uh, 0 0.002 meters, and epsilon R is equal to four. So C hat is epsilon zero, epsilon R, W over D, which is equal to 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12th times uh, four times W, which is 0 0.001, all of that divided by 0 0.002, and that works out to be 1.77 times 10 to the negative 11 farads per meter, or 17.7 picofarads per meter. And L hat, this part is very plug and chug, uh, but plug and chug can be rewarding when you get good and interesting results at the end. Uh, we get 1.2566 times 10 to the negative 6 times 1, even though I didn't say we know that mu sub r is equal to 1, times 0 0.002 divided by 0 0.001, and that works out to be 2.51 times 10 to the negative 6th, or 2.51 micro henries per meter. So that's c hat and l hat. What is the velocity of propagation along that line? So the velocity is 1 over the square root of L hat times C hat, which is 1 over the square root of 2.51 times 10 to the negative sixth times 1.77 times 10 to the negative 11th. And that is 1.50 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Now I'm going to give you a just a spoiler here, a spoiler to chapter 24. I just want to let you know that the velocity of propagation is going to be equal to c divided by the square root of epsilon r. Well, technically it's c divided by the square root of epsilon r mu sub r. But as I mentioned to you earlier, mu sub r is almost always equal to one. So this is a good way to check your answers. I know that this would be uh, c divided by the square root of four or three times 10 to the eighth divided by two, 1.5 times 10 to the eighth, that looks good. Because there's, there's a lot of number crunching that goes on here, and it's nice to be able to check your answers at the end. We're going to prove this next time, but for right now, uh, we're gonna, we're, I just give it to you as a little bit of a spoiler to next time. Now we're going to do a, tw a twin lead transmission line. We have c hat is equal to pi epsilon 0 epsilon r divided by the inverse hyperbolic cosine of d divided by a. And this is pi times 8.854 times 10 to the negative 11th times, and in this case it's just 1, uh, divided by the inverse hyperbolic cosine of 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.001. And this works out to be 9.29 times 10 to the negative 12th farads per meter, or 9.29 picofarads per meter. And then L hat is mu sub zero, mu sub r, divided by pi times the inverse hyperbolic cosine 
of D divided by A, which is going to be 1.2566 times 10 to the negative sixth. That's multiplied by 1 divided by pi times the inverse hyperbolic cosine of 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.001, and that is 1.197 times 10 to the minus sixth farads per meter. You know what? To be consistent, I'm going to call that 1.20 because I've been carrying three significant figures and everything. And so that is 1.20 microfarads per meter. And then to calculate the velocity of propagation, uh, well, let me just say right away, the velocity of propagation better be 3 times 10 to the 8 because epsilon r is equal to 1 in this case. They are separated by free space. And since they're separated by free space, we better find that the velocity of propagation is 3 times 10 to the 8th. So we have 1 over the square root of 1.20 times 10 to the minus 6th times 9.29 .9 times 10 to the minus 12th. And that works out to be 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Feeling pretty good about that. And then, uh, and that's why I said that quite often you'll find that, that uh, the velocity of propagation is going to be either the speed of light c or it will be something close to that, you know, depending on what the, that relative dielectric constant is that composes the wire. And then it says, how long would it take for this signal on this line to travel 3,000 miles? Let me convert 3,000 miles. I'm going to multiply that by one mile per 1,609 meters, and that gives me 4.83 times 10 to the sixth meters, almost 5 million meters. And then the time of, uh, of that that it's going to take to move that far is going to be the distance divided by the velocity, which is 4.83 times 10 to the sixth divided by 3 times 10 to the eighth. And that gives me 1.61 times 10 to the minus 2, or 16.1 milliseconds. Now, if you live in the United States, 3,000 miles is about the width of the country. It's about the distance from, a continental United States at least, it's about the distance from, say, Los Angeles to New York. And so if you, uh, this, first of all, the interesting thing, 16 milliseconds to go from Los Angeles to New York. That's, uh, that's a remarkably quick amount of time when you're going at the speed of light. But here's the reason why this is extra interesting. In, interesting. In a lot of cases in, in digital communication protocols, there's a timeout that occurs after 32 milliseconds. And that's because it's, it's the calculation says, well, unfortunately, this, was, this, this doesn't apply to everywhere, but if it, the, the protocol was created in the United States and their philosophy was, look, if you've waited 32 milliseconds, that's long enough that you could have sent a message from Los Angeles to New York and then received the reply from New York back to Los Angeles again. If it's taking longer than 32 milliseconds, then something else has intervened. This isn't just propagation delay. There's something else that's causing this to happen. And so, so they said, well, anything after 32 milliseconds, we're just gonna we're gonna stop it. We're gonna say reset, retransmit, and see if we can get it back the second time. I just like that that something in uh, in uh, digital communication systems really comes right back to what we talk about in this class. And that 32 milliseconds was a protocol that was established as a result of this calculation right here. Okay, uh, wrapping things up for today, a transmission line is any physical cable with a length more than 10% of the shortest wavelength that's being transmitted. Uh, and uh, if the transmission lines will exhibit stray capacitance and inductance, we can specify those quantities per unit length. Uh, we have a model that distributes the capacitance and inductance along the length of the wire. This shows a model that has four blocks. You could have one that has three blocks or 10 blocks or however many blocks you want to have. Analysis of that model, taking the limit as delta z goes to zero, so in other words, an infinite number of blocks, gives the transmission line equations. Right now, today, they're called the transmission line equations, but 100 years ago, they were the telegrapher's equations. And then further analysis demonstrates that those transmission lines that follow the wave equation with that propagation velocity is going to be 1 over the square root of L hat times C hat. And then this last table here gives the quantities for L hat and C hat for each of the three types of transmission lines that we're going to look at in this book.